yes, like John Mark said, well, first of all, hello. Um, second, yes, like John Mark said, um, we're really excited about this evening, but also really excited about having uh, this conversation just as a church. Um, it's a unique opportunity for us uh, to engage in some of the things that are happening around the world and to talk as a church family about what that means for us. So we want to jump in tonight. We don't want to waste any time. Will you open, with, open your Bibles with me to John chapter 4? Now, usually we work through our text line by line. Tonight, we're going to do a little bit of chunking. Um, we're going to work through it chunk by chunk. Is that okay? Okay. Well, for three of you it is, and the rest of you, <laughs> just going to have to feel your feelings, and we can talk about him later. Um, we're going to start in verse 1. John 4, verse 1. Reads this. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea, and he went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. All right. So here we find Jesus and his disciples ministering throughout the region of Judea. That sounds normal enough. We know stuff about Jesus and his ministries is kind of par for the course when it comes to kind of how he rolls. Now, if you will, look down with me at verse 4. It says, now he had to go through Samaria. That's pretty definitive language and language that scholars have noted was significant for, for, for a few reasons. First, uh, despite it being the fastest route to Galilee, observant Jews, which we know Jesus was, would normally circumvent Samaria by going east instead of south uh, for reasons of purification. They saw the Samaritan people as people who were unclean. More on that in a minute. Now, by all means necessary, we know that Jews would work to avoid this region if they could help it. This was like a, just a known fact in those times. And the emphasis and understanding here is that Jesus, being no more a respecter of places than persons, takes the lower road to Samaria. And he arrives at this town called Sychar, which would now be modern-day Palestine, if you're like trying to figure out geographically where that might be. Now, we read on here that, uh, that there was Jacob's well. This is where Jesus kind of ended up. And, um, and what's significant about that is that Jacob, if you're not familiar uh, with this old uh, Hebrew story, but Jacob was the son of that man named Abraham. Do you remember Abraham? Yeah, he was like a big deal, especially to the Jewish people, but also to us. So this is Abraham's son, Jacob, and this is a well that he dug and that his family lived off of. So this was a significant place, um, not only for the story of people of the Jews, but also just in the history of the world. So Jesus sits down at this well, and we read that he was tired because he had just kind of walked a while in the, the kind of the heat of the day in the Middle East, and we read that it was noon, which brings, brings us to verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. All right, so a Samaritan woman walks up to draw water, and she's doing so at noon, which actually would have been um, pretty culturally abnormal for her to do. It's likely, and some believe, that she did this because she was trying to avoid the other women of the town. So she would draw uh, water at noon as opposed to drawing water later in the afternoon um, because the heat was so severe. So women would usually come later in the afternoon because it was just too intense, not at noon. And, and we find Jesus, and he's at the well with her, and he speaks to her. And not only that, but he asks her to give him water. And this, she knows, is wildly scandalous for many reasons. First, she's a woman. Strike one. Men in that day, especially Jewish rabbis, would do everything they could to avoid contact or acknowledgement of women as they were seen as less valuable, many of them, and more often as utilitarian objects rather than people. Next, she was a Samaritan. Strike two. Samaritans, as one scholar put it, were seen as mongrel Jews, both in blood and religion. 
They were a resettled people, originally Israelites, that settled in cities. And instead of worshiping Yahweh and only marrying other Jews, they intermarried people from different cultures and religions and ultimately ended up uh, worshiping pagan gods, which um, made Samaria a land of religious pluralism, one that rejected the Jewish scriptures, which would be detestable to any Jewish people. It was no secret that the Samaritans were hated and marginalized people. The Jews considered them lesser because of their race and their culture. And so as we read about Jesus chatting up a woman and a Samaritan, we can rightfully reason that he's doing much more than we can perceive, at least on the surface. Notice that he asks her for a drink. He doesn't demand it. And we know from sociology that asking questions is a way of momentarily placing oneself beneath the asked one by means of social power. And so Jesus, provocatively going low in his relation to the woman against all cultural expectations and rights, reveals to her and to us that in the kingdom he was ushering in, there would be no deference given to a culture's dehumanizing expectations. Read on with me in verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the, the gift of God and who it, it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus answers the woman's question, and we find him engaging her in a meaningful way and offering to her something beyond her understanding. He graciously implies that she was clueless as to what he was talking about and who he was. He tells her that if she did know, he would give her this living water. And still somewhat oblivious to the spiritual implications of what Jesus was after, it seems she assumes, just like I think many people in that day and age would, that the living water he was talking about was actually fresh water. Water usually found at the bottom of the well. And so, immediately, with small faith and misdirected asking, she asks him practically how he's going to get that water out of there. He doesn't have the tools to do it. She can see that he's just traveled, and she's the one with the jugs and other things. Then, almost offended, she goes on, and she references Jacob and says, Are you greater than him, that you would find and drink the purest of water from this well? And Jesus, as steady as the horizon, despite her imperfect asking and understanding, goes to work perfectly. And he explains that anyone who drinks the water he gives, the one who he is implying is greater than Jacob, would never be thirsty again and would actually become an eternal spring of life. And still, this woman misunderstands the promise of living water, but in her desperation and boldness cries out for it, saying, Give me this water so I won't be thirsty again and so that I won't have to come here to draw water. Now, this uh, in our text is actually a turning point. Jesus moves in closer to this woman with delicacy and conviction. He makes it clear that he is after far more than just a conversation. Look with me at verse 16. Well, 15. Let's read that one. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, which was an affectionate term. Jesus replied, believe me. <laughs> a time, yes, clarification is helpful. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship 
in the spirit and in truth. Now, Jesus goes on to tell this woman, he says, go get your husband, knowing that she didn't have a husband. And she answers him quickly with the truth, which is quite convenient because he is a prophet and a Messiah. (laughs) So it's like a good thing. You know, some of us would have been like, well, you know, technically I had a husband once, so maybe I should. You know, like, don't you think if you were in the story? I feel like I would have lied. Anyway, uh, (laughs) and he says, good thing, because he was like, yeah, you're right. And you know what? You didn't lie, which was Okay, good. So in this statement that she makes, she's actually revealing that she doesn't have an identity in her communal culture. That's kind of what's taking shape. And then he proceeds, as he does with so many of us, to read her mail, acknowledging that he knows she's been married five times and was living with a man who wasn't her husband. And I want you to notice here his tone. His question is direct and personal, and it hits directly in her heart, but it is held up on both sides with compliments. Jesus is tender with this woman. Now, when we read that this woman had five husbands, a lot of us in our paradigm would assume that she was an immoral, unfaithful, or adulterous woman. But it's important that you at least consider that that assumption may be wrong. Many other cultures would likely read this as though she was a victim. What I mean is it's entirely possible that she was much more the victim of thoughtless men's divorces or of tragic deaths than she was immoral herself. We don't actually know why she had five husbands, but it may not be what many of us would naturally assume. Women in that day and time had no rights when it came to divorces or other legal matters, and this might have contributed to the circumstances she found herself in. Now, Jesus did observe that the man she was living with was not her husband, which may in fact have made her guilty of some form of adultery. But again, because we know that in her culture, a woman wouldn't have been able to live independently and would need a protector it's more likely that she would have been a domestic servant or a concubine of sorts to the man she was living with. Still, making her, in the eyes of her culture, second class, not only in gender and nationality, but also in morality, which is strike three. In verse 19, we find her changing the subject, which sometimes I do when I'm not comfortable either. And um, she acknowledges that Jesus was a prophet, obviously. She's like, how else could you know about me? And If he was a prophet, it would raise the question about where is the right place to worship. Now, again, I I have a feeling she wasn't desperately interested in a theological discussion, though she might have been. Um, But here she begins to kind of uh, shift in subject matter. Now, Jesus, unfazed by this, as he usually is, goes on to say, almost poetically, believe me. And in that, declares, as only a true priest could, that there would be restoration of true worship spirit and truth to a place, to Samaria, who had lost it. Yes, he says salvation would come from the Jews, subtly and not so subtly, pointing back to the reality of who was sitting before her. Read with me verse 25. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. The woman here, still in a posture of seeking, is almost saying something like, you know, thank you for your abstract lecture on worship. I'm I'm sure she was stimulated. That's very fascinating. Um, But I I imagine there's a piece of her that was going, but I don't quite get it. You know, I, I, I just don't understand fully everything that you're talking about. But one thing I do want you to know is that we Samaritans, us too, are waiting for a Messiah. And when he comes, then he will be able to make clear to me the things I don't understand. And in verse 26, Jesus, for the first time in John's gospel, says to the marginalized, discarded, could-be immoral, social woman outcast from a pagan culture, I am he. Revealing that he, in fact, was the Messiah she both needed and was waiting for. In Samaria, we find Jesus declaring in presence and words that he is not only the Messiah for the Jews, but of the Samaritans and for the whole world. Elaine Storkey, in her book, Scars Across Humanity, beautifully articulates the reality of what we find in today's text when she says this. The gospel gives us a glimpse uh, of how Jesus cuts open cultural norms, hierarchies, stereotypes, and the low status of women, and injects the reality of equal significance before God. What we see in Jesus not only shows us God's heart for, but his posture towards women, and those who have suffered injustice at the hands of the culture, the state, or religion. 
Jesus, waist deep in a shame culture, unashamedly moved towards this woman in a way that not only changed the trajectory of her life forever, but also showed us as his apprentices what it would mean to care for those who were like her, people who are acquainted with the woes of injustice while simultaneously in need of understanding their place in God's story. Notice a few things about Jesus' response to her. First, he took her seriously, which means that he saw her and he valued her. In a culture where women were objectified and discarded, in a time where the ramifications for adultery often meant death and being with unclean people meant you too would become unclean, a Jewish rabbi not only engaged this woman, but he did so without ignoring any of her realities or limitations. He didn't diminish or placate who she was or what she had done. In fact, he takes her situation very seriously. But he also didn't let them be the determining factor in her future or her destiny. Just as serious as he was about honoring who she was in the moment, he too was serious about honoring who she might become. Which takes me to our next point. Jesus honored her story. Notice how Jesus spoke to her. First, he didn't ignore her. He didn't command or demand her to do anything, which was culturally opposite of how things had been. Instead, he asked questions. Questions that at their core encouraged an entirely new way of thinking and an exploration of her own identity, which would have definitely been considered unorthodox, but also provided an alternative to the story her life had told. Jesus personally engaged the realities of her situation, allowing no room for shame or condemnation, but offering freedom from the places that she still found herself bound to. Putting his reputation on the line, sacrificing his honor for hers, Jesus knew that loving her well would start with honoring her. Finally, we see from all of this that despite her ability to fully understand or even engage all the things that Jesus was talking about, he didn't give up on her and say, like, well, this is just a lost cause, or this is just too messy, this is too complicated, this is too much. No, instead, he takes it a step further, and he offers her something more, something greater than her circumstances changing. He offers her himself. He offers her soul healing, freedom from her shame and way of life altogether. He offered her an entirely new identity. He saw beyond what met the eye, and he called her to a life where she could actually be satisfied. Would it remedy and fix everything externally? No, there was no guarantee of that, but it could, like a spring, provide new source of life in her. Jesus' interaction with the woman at the well teaches us a lot about where we start when we have to begin engaging our world, a big world we know exists, often in all fairness, by way of documentaries or the occasional story, but because of our Western privilege, fail to understand or acknowledge in a deeper way. Jesus calls us as his disciples to, like him, take injustice seriously to honor the story of those who suffer at its hand and to offer them not an institutionalized solution, but Jesus himself. All throughout the scriptures, Jesus moved towards the marginalized, constantly breaking barriers of racial bigotry, cultural oppression, hierarchy, and prejudice. And through practice and compassion, he disarmed injustice with both strength and humility. And I believe our call is no different. As we read a text like this one, we can't leave it without asking ourselves what it means for us. The story of the woman at the well teaches us that God loves humanity in ways that often challenges our ideas or understanding. If we're to be like our rabbi, it means that we too must be people who place value on others even when culture doesn't. Obviously, there's a ton that could be said here by way of gender, race, socioeconomic status, and other realms of injustice, but if I could, just for a moment, and just for the sake of time, use the example of women, including the lives of women, not just here in Portland, but around the world. We need to be people who begin to take things seriously, like who is making our clothes and how that affects the lives of women we so easily claim to champion. It was recently reported that 71% of all garment workers are women and girls. That's about 34 million people. Clothing made around the world, mostly in developing countries, experiencing the exploitation of cheap labor and the violation of workers' rights. 
It means that we as Portlanders acknowledge that we have more strip clubs per capita than any other city in the U.S., providing a backdoor for illegal prostitution and rampant abuse. Women monetized for entertainment, many of whom are sexual abuse survivors themselves, stuck in a life and cycle largely perpetuated by chronic trauma and socioeconomic status. What would it look for the ch like for the church in Portland to love these women and to offer them better jobs, better benefits with security and other things in that way? What would it mean if we just actually embraced and then loved them well? Being like Jesus in this area means that we listen to and honor the stories of those that our culture and other cultures around the world say are not valuable, respectable, or even believable. It means as part of our discipleship to Jesus, we work to eradicate prejudice and bigotry from our own lives. First acknowledging it and then repenting of it and then working with one another to see it eradicated and uprooted from systems in our city. And it also means that we, as, as Jesus people, hold everyone in high esteem, seeing their worth as people who bear the image of God and letting that be our first framework when it comes to caring for our neighbor. It also means that we show compassion to the outsider and the marginalized. It's been said that compassion is recognizing and having an emotional response to another person's suffering, while at the same time having a desire to help in some way. It's a combination of both empathy and action. So showing compassion as Jesus did means that we not only empathize, meaning we work to become educated and knowledgeable about the lives and circumstances of those on the outside, but we also work to become advocates as well, standing with them in their suffering and seeking with them a remedy. Practically, this means just like basic level stuff of like familiarizing yourself with the refugee crisis in Portland with Refugee Care Collective, a nonprofit that was birthed even out of this place in the heart of a young woman. Familiarizing yourself with the foster care system in Portland and how it's all working and how you can stand and enter into that space. And then for a lot of us, it just means that we need to figure out who the outsiders are, first in our church family, and then in our community, and then in our city, and in our state, and in our nation, it's a ripple effect. And we're going to have to stop long enough in that space to move outside of ourselves and our comfort to acknowledge their pain. Finally, it means that we embrace a restored vision for humanity. What we see in our story is Jesus is not just speaking about the kingdom, but he's actually ushering it in, physically representing the realities of a kingdom he inaugurated and showing us as his disciples what it means to be people who truly worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus' vision for human flourishing includes men and women fully representing and believing, not just for themselves but for one another, their identity as image bearers of God, and in that reflecting and demonstrating the message and the power of the gospel. It's what author Carolyn Custis James calls the blessed alliance, this reality that as disciples we were created to embody God's restored vision for human flourishing. That means we cannot and we will not flourish if it is at the expense of another. Hope for a restored humanity envisions well-being for all people, those who are spiritually poor, those who are economically and socially and circumstantially poor. It is the message we must embrace as disciples and one we must be ready to live into. The problem is there is a real temptation for many of us in this space to see injustice more as a problem to avoid or a project to fix. What I mean is it's easy in spaces of injustice to take the human out of the equation and to categorize people long before considering their name or their story or seeing their face. Um, when I was uh, putting this teaching together, um, my friend and professor at Western Seminary, Gary Brashears, was giving me a ton of feedback, which was helpful and scary. Um, but, and there was a term he used that I actually had never heard in my lifetime, but apparently it's a thing. Have you heard of slacktivism? No? Yes? Is that a thing? You're nodding your head, I can't see you. You're not nodding it hard enough. I can't see. Anyway, I'm just going to assume you don't know what it is because I didn't know what it was. Is John Mark knew what it was, but I don't know. Anyway, it's selective activism. Someone said, is it slacker activism? I was like, I don't know. Maybe it's that too. So be convicted either way, whatever you want. 
what selective activism is here is um, it's this idea that we will, as people, engage in outrage on Twitter, in a rant or whatever, rather than getting involved with a real person or agency where change will actually begin. It's this idea that in our generation we choose to do the things that are easy and accessible and at the same time there's a call to a deeper place that would require and cost us far more than a lot of us are willing to give, which is why our best efforts won't be enough. We will need the gospel's potency to bring wholeness and purpose to trampled and discarded lives. In her book, Half the Church, Carolyn Custis James writes, the Bible's message for women and the oppressed doesn't depend on ideal circumstances, but applies fully to those who live in the brutal outskirts of society where poverty engulfs, education is non-existence, women's bodies are ravaged, and lives are in constant peril. The church needs and has a theology robust enough to not only swallow up injustice whole, but to encompass the lives of men and women everywhere. The question is, will we just as Jesus did embrace it and embody it? To close, would you look with me back at our text? We're going to look at verse 27. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Look down at verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. A woman who should have been marked by her shame and the shame of her story now stands and says, he told me everything I ever did. And this testimony is something that not only impacted her life, but it's testifying to us centuries later. This woman's encounter with Jesus changed her entire city. True worship did, in fact, come to Samaria, and it came through the least likely of people. And it came because of who Jesus, our Messiah, was and what he did. The kingdom of God reaches both high and low. And I think that some of us today need to be reminded of that. Others still need to hear that Jesus takes your life seriously, and he honors the story you have, but he is inviting and always inviting you into something more. Wherever you're at today, my prayer is that you'll join with me in asking God to make us more like Jesus, to place value on all people, taking an intentional look and interest in valuing those on the margins, the oppressed, the exploited, and to open our eyes to the outsider and to ultimately embrace his vision for his kingdom. Look, this is a, a, a complicated teaching, can be in many ways. Um, so I'm not standing up here as an expert or um, a pro at all of this stuff. In fact, I'm just like a very tiny baby in the story, trying to figure it out and wrapping my head theologically around so many of these truths that I have ignored most of my life. So, so here's what I want to say, that I think for most of us today, it's probably just going to start in small ways, our response to this teaching. It means we're going to avoid the temptation to perpetuate injustice by being mindful about what we buy, how much we buy, and where it comes from in this particularly holiday season. For others, it's just probably going to mean that you are going to actively seek someone out, just one person out, and, and you're going to find ways to offer them love and friendship and to care for them. Someone who's normally on the outside, the challenge would be, would we just bring them in and maybe even offer them living water? This conversation isn't an easy one. It's complicated and there's nuance and there's all kinds of things connected to it. But at the heart of it, I believe it is just a calling to be more like Jesus it's a call to move towards him in closer ways to be transformed and conformed into his likeness. 
And so the call for all of us as his disciples today is to do that, to take one step towards him by way of being mindful of these realities that are taking place in our life. Now, normally, I would have you stand at this point, um, but if I could, I'd like to do just something a little bit different. And the truth is, I can, because I'm the boss up here now. <laughs> I say it regularly, but it's true. So um, here's what I'd like to do. If you're a woman in this room, would you just stand up for a moment? It's going to be a lot of you. I learned that this morning. <laughs> also, I know the math, so. Um, I, I want to say, I'm... Um, I'm having you stand, because I just had a sense in this teaching that God um, wanted to give you a blessing. And so I'd like to do that just as your sister and your friend um, in this room. And brothers, this is not, please hear me, not even remotely, never will be taught or spoken about at the expense of you. Never. That's not the gospel of Jesus. But I do have a sense that there are some specifically in this room tonight, some women who need to hear just as a Samaritan woman did that you are seen and valued, that Jesus takes you seriously, that he honors the story that you have, but he is not done. He is inviting you into more. So whatever way you identify with this woman, I would bless you to say he's not quite done yet. And if you find yourself in oppressive situations and violent situations and culturally tough situations like this woman too, again, I want to bless you and say there's a way out. And it starts with the man who gives himself to you. So, um, men, will you join us now? We're just going to close our teaching out.